From the KTVB News Group, this is a Decision 2018 special, the race for U.S. Congress in Idaho's 2nd District. Longtime incumbent Republican Mike Simpson is running for his 11th term in Congress. But Democratic candidate Aaron Swisher is hoping to take his place. Now, from the center stage at the Brand Center, the two will square off on the issues, including health care, immigration, and fiscal and foreign policy. Who will earn your vote? This is the debate for U.S. Representative District 2. Here is News Channel 7's D. Sartre. Good evening and welcome to our debate tonight. We are glad that you have tuned in. I know I speak for myself, the panelists and the candidates tonight. It is important that you have decided to spend this hour with us and we're glad you're here. Our two candidates tonight are running for Congress in District 2 and that is a voting area that covers eastern Idaho westward to most of Boise. We welcome Democratic nominee Aaron Swisher and current Congressman Mike Simpson. Glad that you decided to uh, join us tonight for this important debate. They're going to introduce themselves in more depth in just a minute. But first, a reminder that our goal tonight is to give the candidates equal time. And we'll be keeping track of that while we also encourage a free-flowing conversation. And uh, that does stay on topic, however. Let me show you who our panelists are this evening. First, we start with our uh, KTVB journalists and my colleagues, Mike, Mark Johnson and Doug Petcash. Glad to have you both here tonight, of course, and Betsy Russell with the Idaho Press. And in addition, KTVB producer Tyson Miller is going to be helping the candidates keep track of their time. So before we begin, let me thank Northwest Nazarene University for their hospitality and allowing us to use the Brandt Center for this evening's debate. So time now for the candidates to introduce themselves and you each have one minute to do so and by the uh, flip of a coin it was decided that Congressman Simpson will go first. Thank you Dee and thank KTVB for hosting this debate tonight. It's been the honor of my life to serve as the congressman from the 2nd Congressional District. I love this state. I love the people in this state. I've worked hard and I think I have a record of accomplishment for the second district, whether it's expanding the role of the Idaho National Laboratory, whether it's creating the Boulder White Clouds Wilderness in central Idaho, whether it's fixing the wildfire funding that uh, for too long has been deficient and caused these and helped cause these massive wildfires, whether it's the legislation I currently have to permanently reauthorize the Land and Water Conservation Fund while addressing the backlog maintenance of our national parks. Whether it's helping local communities like the city of Boise and the EPA with fixing the Dixie Drain or creating the Dixie Drain, which is going to save the ratepayers hundreds of thousands of dollars. I hope I've been a congressman that you can be proud of. That's why I'm asking for your vote on November 6th. Thank you, Congressman. And now Mr. Swisher. Yeah, I want to thank KTVB, the moderator and panelist, for putting on tonight's debate as well. And I also want to thank the folks who are tuning in at home. I'm Aaron Swisher an economist, father, husband, and like many of you, an avid outdoor outdoorsman here in Idaho. I love kayaking and fly fishing, hunting with my wife and backpacking in Idaho's great outdoors. We not only need to preserve these outdoor activities for future generations, but make sure that all of us can enjoy this, the opportunity we have for a great quality of life here in Idaho by making sure that we have an economy that allows common everyday workers to thrive. I represent a new approach to our country's economic problems and a new generation of leadership here in Idaho. I have not only studied the federal budget extensively, I'm the only candidate in this race who has put forward a detailed economic plan that would strengthen our economy, revive our rural communities, and help everyone have access to affordable health care. I'm asking for your vote on November 6th. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's turn it over to our panelists and start with my colleague Mark Johnson who starts off tonight's questioning. Well, one of, if not the biggest caravans of Central American migrants looking to cross into the U.S. border continues to make its way northward right now. This is fresh. Reports out of Washington have the Pentagon dispatching upwards of a thousand troops right now to assist in security operations at the border. And the president is saying like the last time that a similar event like this happened, he said that the unarmed migrants will be stopped. Given the situation with separating children from their parents, as well as the president's push for a border wall, which he continues to talk about and more, where do you land on this issue? And how would you go about narrowing the partisan chasm that exists right now 
in the immigration debate. Congressman, we'll have you start. Well, obviously, Congress needs to take up immigration and finally pass some legislation. It's something that we've been working on for a number of years, but we haven't found that sweet spot where it can, where it can actually get a majority in Congress to address it. That's going to be the first thing. But secondly, you can't allow this caravan to come in with all of these undocumented uh, people coming into the United States because they're already starting another caravan in Guatemala now. And that will continue to, to uh, push the border. We can't have family separation. That was actually a policy that was started during the Obama administration. It became an issue with the Trump administration because there were so many of them. So we've got to, we make, we've got to make sure that we don't separate families, but we can't let them come in to this country illegally. It's making it harder to do legal immigration. You're seeing the number of refugees that we're taking are being down because of all of the illegals that are coming into this country. So uh, dispensing the troops on the border, they're not going to be actually down there uh, doing the enforcement. They're going to be relieving the border security people so that they can do their job. Uh, but it's going to be difficult. I agree with the congressman to some degree. Um, I'm okay with obviously preventing these folks from entering the country, but we have a process here in this country um, for asylum seekers. Part of the problem is that we have not invested in that process well enough. So it's not very efficient, it's not very effective, and this process takes longer than it should. Um, we should invest in that process process and uh, complete comprehensive immigration reform so that we have a secure border. We're treating people humanely. We're not taking kids away from their parents. I totally oppose that. Um, but that we're processing these folks in a fair and efficient manner. The ones who um, legitimately get asylum can stay and get assimilated. Those who don't, you know, get turned back. Why has Congress not offered boots on the ground help for the core reason why those migrants are looking for a better life. A local nonprofit organization known as Samia Nueva is on the ground there helping them with corn and nutritious corn to try to help those people. And they're saying the United States isn't helping those people find a better life. Why? You know, basically, this sounds kind of tough, but why these people should be marching is to the capitals in their countries and demanding the capitalism that we have in this country that's created a better life for all Americans. We cannot be the recipients of all the people in the world that want a better life. Uh, we have an orderly process that we need to maintain. I've actually had legislation uh, for several years that would increase the number of immigration courts. That's one of the problems, is that our immigration courts are so overrun that these people come in, uh, the number seeking uh, asylum, uh, or political refuge is up like from 9% to 38% because they're down there training them of what to say when they get here. Mm. And we need the courts because right now there's not enough room to put these people so all of a sudden it's the catch and release program and then a lot of them don't come back to the courts and they're off in the country somewhere. Uh, we've got to control our borders. I support immigration, but I support legal immigration. I support the refugees we bring into this country because we're doing a great job with it here in Boise and down in Twin Falls. The refugee centers, centers are doing a great job. So uh, it's just Congress needs to find that sweet spot where we can get 218 votes. Mr. Swisher, if you don't mind if I jump in, I see you nodding in agreement, it seems as though you are. Would you be bucking what at least appears to be a very loud voices within the, the Democratic Party back in Washington, D.C. to have open borders and really to do quite a different approach than what you're espousing? Yeah, I am not for open borders. In fact, the only group that I know of that is um, openly for open borders is are the Koch brothers, uh, David and Charles. They're the ones who seem to be um, the one pushing for open borders. Uh, I am not for open borders. I agree with the congressman. We need, we need a secure border. We need to treat people humanely. We shouldn't be separating kids from their families. We've got hundreds that will never make it back with their parents, um, but we need to invest in this whole process. Um, I don't know how we get that done when there are people in Congress who continue to cut revenue. We're already don't have a balanced budget and spending on everything is difficult to come up with because we keep cutting revenue. At some point we have to stop doing that and consider adding more, which used to be a position that the congressman advocated. Do you want to respond? I would just say that uh, one of the problems in Congress is we've got two sides to this debate, obviously, like there usually is. 
On the one side, the Democrats want to make all of a sudden all these people that are here illegally, want to make them citizens and give them the right to vote and everything else. Well, that's not going to happen. On the other side, there are a bunch of Republicans that would like to just deport everybody. That's not going to happen either. And we're trying to find that spot in between where we can get 218 votes. I actually think there are enough members of Congress that want to solve this problem and that will continue to work on it. We had two bills up last year. Both of them failed. Uh, there's now coming with an ag worker bill that will, will uh, hopefully address the agricultural problem. The DACA issue should be an easy one to fix. I don't know if anybody that wants to send those kids that came through no fault of their own, they came with their parents. What do you expect them to do? Stop at the border and say, uh, Mom and Dad, I can't go because that's illegal. They came here as children. They know no other country. Where are you going to deport them to? We can fix that. President Trump wanted to fix that, but he wanted border security also, and consequently he couldn't get it done. Let's move on to Betsy Russell from Idaho Press. Uh, first, just a quick follow-up for Congressman Simpson. You said just a couple of moments ago that the number of refugees coming into our country is down, quote, because of all of the illegals that are coming in. What is the tie between those two things? We can only accept so many people into this country. And when you have more people coming in illegally, it's tough to, to have the quota. We already accept a million immigrants into this country today. A million immigrants a year into this country, more than all the rest of the countries combined. We have a record of being supportive of immigrants. Consequently, when you have all of these people come in, coming in illegally, it's natural that it reduces the number of people that can come legally. legally. And Mr. Swisher, did you have a response to that? No, you know, all, all I would simply say is that he staked out two um, obviously very extreme positions for the right and left, and neither of those represent my, um, you know, my stance on the issue. Or mine. Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, this question is for Mr. Swisher. Um, you wrote a book, Resuscitating America, in which you wrote that wages in America stopped rising in tandem with worker productivity in the 1970s, creating a fundamental flaw in our modern economy that has led to major income inequality, and that we need to fix this. Mm -hmm. How would you do that as a member of Congress from Idaho? Yeah, you really need a comprehensive approach to get that done. You need to create a floor under wages where people working 40 hours a week can take care of themselves and not be reliant on the, the federal government. So that's a minimum wage increase. When you do that, you really need to pair that with tax reform so it's easy and smooth for small businesses. You need to do immigration reform and trade reform. When you do both of those, you have to come up with a system that is fair to American workers we have to have some sort of carbon tax so that we are protecting the environment, uh, halting our global warming or climate change without a lot of regulation and red tape. We need to reform court, the corporate tax structure, um, and we also need to strengthen our antitrust uh, legislation so that we've got a competitive econ economy. You mentioned the minimum wage. What do you believe we should do with the minimum wage? I think you've got to get it up somewhere in the ballpark of $15 an hour. You need to do that gradually over you know, six or seven years. The key that you don't hear anyone in Washington talking about is pairing this with tax reform. That's, that's the ticket because there are a couple negative aspects to raising the minimum wage that are particularly difficult for small businesses. If you do tax reform at the same time and you do it the right way, you can actually mitigate those. How do you see an increase in the minimum wage over six to seven years to $15 an hour playing out here in Idaho? I think it'll be great for Idaho and Idaho's small communities. Look, let's say you live in a small community in Idaho and you have a Walmart or a McDonald's or a Lowe's or Home Depot, some set of big box stores, right? People that go and spend their money at those stores, the store takes that revenue and does three things with it. It buys cost of goods sold, that money typically goes out of state. It pays profits to its shareholders, right? And then it pays the employees. The, um, the employee piece is the only piece that stays in state, in the community. If that wage is higher, there is more money in the community for other small family-owned businesses to garner for, as revenue. Congressman Simpson, despite recent gains, Idaho's per capita income ranks 44th in the nation, and we have the seventh highest percentage of minimum wage earners at 3.3%. You have served in Congress for two decades. Why haven't you been able to change that? Actually, I did vote for the last minimum wage increase. 
uh, when it was 515, it went to 725. And we should have indexed it at the time. Suggestion I made, they ultimately decided not to, not to do it. The Democrats were in charge there, but I voted for it. Mainly because I came home and I talked to businesses and called businesses and said, what are you paying? I couldn't find anybody that was paying below 725. Uh, the reality is there's another way to grow this economy. There's another way to improve the lives of uh, Idahoans. That is grow the economy. If you look at what's happening right now, we have strong economic growth. We have had for the last several quarters, uh, 4.2, I think, this last quarter. We have unemployment at the lowest level that it's been since 1960. Lowest level it's been since 1960. You know what low unemployment does? A, more people go to work, which is good, but it also puts competition for labor. And you're starting to see the cost and the, and the pay for labor go up right now. I think it was uh, in manufacturing, it was like 5.9% over last year it's gone up. So there are different ways of doing it without getting the government involved in, in uh, taxing and carbon taxes and BTU taxes and taxes on everything else. Make businesses more profitable. Go around this state and ask businesses how they're doing. Highest business confidence that we've had in a long, long time. The other thing that low unemployment does, believe it or not, is it extends the solvency of your Social Security and your Medicare system because more people are working and paying into it. Mr. Swisher. I'd, I'd like to address a couple of those things. First of all, there's a lot of hay made in Washington about how much the economy is growing. For most people, it doesn't matter how much is growing because they're not sharing in that growth. That's the point that I was making in the book. Once upon a time, workers shared in the productivity growth that they helped create. That's not happening anymore. So it doesn't matter if the economy grows at 5% or 10% or 1%. If they're not getting any of the growth, then it doesn't matter to most people. It's all being sucked away by the top. The second point I would make is yes, a tight labor market will raise wages, but it won't get them to where they need to be unless you can keep the labor market this tight for four or five years. We're gonna have a recession pretty soon, probably within the next year. And so all that wage uh, demand that we've built up is, is just going to be for naught. The government does have a role to play here. The other point I would make is regard, in regards to the carbon tax or the BTU tax. My opponent is on record for saying that we need to raise more revenue as part of balancing the budget. Why not have companies pay for the energy they use and the environmental damage that is done from that energy through a BTU or carbon tax. Look, one of the problems we're facing as a country is the potential automa automation of our jobs. We never discuss where the energy is gonna come from to automate those jobs or what the ramifications of it are. Having a BTU or a carbon tax would make sure that that is factored in when those businesses make those decisions and it would also slow down that that drive to automate our jobs away? I would say that this is the main problem. First of all, you do a $15 an hour minimum wage when the federal government does it. How does a $15 an hour minimum wage compare in California to Salmon, Idaho? Different states, different economies, different local communities. $15 an hour wage in California probably doesn't do you much good. That's one of the problems. The other thing is the fundamental difference between Aaron and I that was just pointed out. He believes that government's role is to tax people and then spend it on something better that they like more. I think it's to reduce taxes and get the economy growing. You're seeing the highest wage growth we've seen in nine years, I think. And that will continue as long as we keep the economy growing. I don't think the economy, I don't think the government needs to grow. Congressman, you said you voted for the last minimum wage increase, but that was a decade ago. Yep. Do you support increasing the current minimum wage now? I thought we should have back then indexed the minimum wage so that we didn't keep facing this problem year after year after year. I could probably vote for some minimum wage. In fact, I asked the minority leader uh, when they were opposing our tax bill, why didn't you insist on an increase of the minimum wage? At that time we were looking at 10, 1025, something like that. Why didn't you insist on that to get your support for the tax bill? I said, oh, we probably wouldn't have gone for it anyway. It's called compromise. It's called working with people across the aisle to try to find solutions to these things. I was at a fiscal symposium back in 2013 uh, that 
Congressman Simpson attended, uh, along with a number of other senators and, and representatives from Washington. He was on record at that time not only saying that we need more revenue in order to balance the budget, but that a lot of congressional representatives were going to lose their job balancing the budget because there were tough decisions to be made, and he was okay with that as long as they got the job done. Now, he had the opportunity last fall to make one of those tough decisions, stand up against his party, and, and say no to adding $1.5 trillion to, to our national debt for a tax cut we don't need. You talk about wanting to raise taxes. You just have to stop cutting them when we don't need to. If, you, if, if, if lowering taxes is the only way you know to grow the economy, you're not a good economist. What happens when taxes get to zero? Then what do you do when you have a recession? Let's jump to Doug, because I know your question well, is to, to this that? issue. You, you can, but I think, you, I think Doug will help I'm going to ignore your question, question and here. respond. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll just keep asking questions over top of your okay. answer, so it'll all balance out. Um, Congressman, this week, President Trump did announce that he wants to uh, give the middle class a 10% tax cut, yep. and he wants to start work on that right after the midterm elections. This, of course, would be on top of the massive tax cut that uh, Congress approved earlier. Do you think a tax cut aimed at the middle class at this time is the right thing to do? Why or why not? Have to look at it and see exactly what he proposes. But let me say for my economist friend here, he's right. Zero percent taxes get you zero revenue. The other one that gets you zero revenue is 100 percent taxes. Now, where in that bell curve do you get the most revenue at the lowest rate? The reality is, is this economic recovery that's happening right now did not just fall out of the sky. It happened because we lowered taxes on corporations and they're bringing money back into the economy that was kept overseas and the way we tax foreign or international corporations. That was essential. It also lowered taxes on the average individual and stuff. If you look at an average middle, a, a middle income individual with a wife and two kids, they have 32 more hundred dollars of disposable income today than they did a year ago. That's how you get the economy growing. Absolutely, you can lower taxes too much. But being economists, you tell me what the lowest rate is we can get. I, I, I think we're already at a point where we're not raising the revenue we need to, right? And you've said that yourself, right? You, you can't make the cuts. Your party, nor my party, can make the cuts to balance the budget, but yet you keep reducing revenue, and you're trying to convince yourself that these tax cuts pay for themselves and add revenue. They never have. We went from a surplus when Mike Simpson came into office to a budget deficit because of the Bush tax cuts he paid for, or, or, or that he voted for. You know, we've done this numerous times, and it has failed us every time, and we keep going back to the same well. well I am me, bringing a new approach. Let me explain how this works. CBO has to make an estimate on if you cut taxes, how much revenue will come in or how much revenue you will lose when you cut taxes. Several years ago, they, they cut the capital gains tax. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was like they cut it 50%. And they said, well, you're going to lose 50% of the revenue from the capital gains tax. Guess what? The next year, they tripled the revenue from the capital gains tax because it freed people to invest in, and take money out of poor investments and put them into more productive investments. The CBO, when they, when they talked about this uh, tax cut, said that, okay, it's going to cost $1.5 trillion over 10 years in lost revenue. Their estimate was that the economy, because of this, would grow, instead of the 1.8% uh, anemic growth we had had in the last several years, they said it'll probably boost it to 1.9%. Last two quarters, it's been around 4.2%. quarter before that, around 3%. If it grows to 2.5%, the tax cut pays for itself. If it grows over that, you've actually made money. It is called a short-term loss in revenue for a long-term gain in revenue. I, I would just once again say that the Democrats do not have the right approach to fixing the economy by creating government programs, you know, and giving money away. The Republicans don't have the right approach by continually cutting taxes, and we don't need the Federal Reserve printing money. These are three bad ways that we've been using for decades as a country um, to help revitalize our, con our economy. None of them are sustainable. None of them work in the long term. I am bringing a new approach to Washington. Let's go to Mark. Oh, did you want to ask a follow-up? I, I do have a, a, sure. a related follow-up on that. What, the national debt right now stands at $21 trillion. Yep. 
What needs to be done about that? If you look at the national debt and you look at the federal budget, which is around $4 trillion, 4 .2, something like that, 40 years ago, it was 70% discretionary spending. That's everything we spend on what you consider government, whether it's defense, Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce, Energy and Water, all the different departments that if I ask you what does government do, you would typically answer, that's government. That was 70% of the, of the budget. Today, it's 72% entitlements and 28% discretionary spending. We have actually kept discretionary spending down over the last several years. The problem is, is entitlements are growing faster than we can cut or reduce the rest of discretionary spending. If we don't get a uh, control of entitlements, and I'm not talking about taking away people's Social Security or Medicare, but we have to reform them. Because if we don't, in about 10 years, all you're going to have the money for is entitlements and defense, period. Nothing else. Mr. Swisher. Yeah, well, that's the Republican game plan. They keep passing these tax cuts that blow up the deficit, and now they want to pay for them by cutting Medicare and Social Security. If you're in favor of that, um, you know, vote for Mr. Simpson. I am against that. Um, I do know how to reform Social Security, but the first thing you need if you're going to reform any of these programs is an economy that, where people don't have to rely on them. Most working people are, are going to be wholly reliant on Medicare and Social Security. They should have an income that allows them to save for themselves through a 401k so they're not reliant on Social Security as much. That makes the program much easier to reform, but that's not part of the Republican playbook. You've got to get wages up for people. It's the only way we're going to make the economy work and sustainable in the long term. Actually, we have been trying to reform the Social Security system, but it's always been the third rail in politics. If you touch it, you die. The fact is, is when Social Security started, there were like 17 and a half or 16 and a half workers for every retiree. The average lifespan was 65. Today, the average lifespan is 80, and there's two and a half workers for every retiree. That's a system that does not pencil out anymore. What we've tried to do is protect those people currently dependent on Social Security and Medicare if you're within 10 years of retirement or something like that. But these young people putting money into the Social Security system today, if we don't reform it, they will get about 73 cents back for every dollar they put in. That's a bad investment. Okay, one quick rebuttal here. I, I appreciate that it's a tough subject. The thing that doesn't make it any easier is constantly reducing revenue, particularly if those tax cuts always go to the corporations and the wealthy. And let me just say in rebuttal to that, cutting the corporate tax rates and the individual tax rates have absolutely nothing to do with the solvency of Social Security or Medicare, and I would have thought you would have known that. Let's move on. Mark, would you like to take on another subject for I us? I would. This one will be really easy. Health care. Thank you. Continues to be uh, one of the biggest debates in Washington and also here in Idaho. I uh, have the fortune fortunate uh, to monitor the comments on our Facebook live feed that I'm, I'm seeing right now. Uh, one of the more colorful ones, but in the middle of the bullseye, Amanda Hughes wrote, what about medical? What are you or will you do for the people that need insurance but can't even afford the Obamacare crap? I talked to, we don't edit anything here. <laughs> I talked to a doctor today who told me he has patients, he can't heal because even though they have health insurance, they can't afford the medication due to the high deductible they're paying. The average family deductible is at $8,000 a year, according to eInsurance.com. We're becoming a nation of insured people that can't afford health care. Uh, many, the middle and lower classes are saying they are worse off now than at any time in their lives. Mr. Swisher. What would be the urgency for you in Washington to fix this, and what is the fix? Yeah, I, it, it, it's, a, it's a top priority. You have to get your economy, a good base under your economy first, um, but it's definitely one of the things that we need worked on right after that. I am in favor of a Medicare for All type proposal. You wouldn't have to buy into that. It would be a public option if you wanted to. Look, I've, I have a friend named Matt Nelson who tried to open a clinic uh, up close to I. Idaho City, between Boise and Idaho City, right? He saw that there was a need there in that community for health care services. He opened his clinic, he had plenty of patients, plenty of need for those services, but most of them couldn't pay him because they're not covered. 
Um, we spend about 19% of our GDP, 19% of our yearly income on healthcare services. And the government is on the hook for about two thirds of that between Medicare, Medicaid, and tax breaks that we give to private insurers. If you could create a Medicare for all type system that would give consumers buying power in the market and bend that cost curve down to where we're anywhere close to nine or 10%, the way that most other in industrialized nations pay, um, the government could pick up that extra third of the healthcare cost, still save money, not have to increase taxes, and actually lower the deficit in future years. I believe that's possible. Well, Mark, uh if you like your health care system, your health care insurance, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep it. The average individual is going to save $2,000 a year under the current plan. Remember those promises? They didn't turn out to be true. And in fact, the cost of premiums is going through the roof. The other thing that was said is we're going to increase competition in the market. That's what's going to keep prices down. That's usually what happens. Guess what? There's a third of the counties in this country that have one insurer, a third of them. First of all, we've got to bring competition back into the healthcare system. And I think we can do that. We're trying to repeal much of the, of the Obamacare. We've done some of it. But the basic assumption in, the, in Obamacare was wrong. And in fact, I talked to many Democrats when they were passing that bill who said, this really isn't a good bill, but it's the only way we can get to a one-payer system, which is they ultimately wanted to go to. And that's what they're, that's what they're proposing now, is a one-payer system. I don't think that's good for our health care system. And so uh, we passed or we, we introduced the American Health Care Act. The Democrats are out saying, oh, we don't care about people with pre existing conditions. We take care of pre existing conditions in this bill. So it's, it's going in the, in the right direction that we're debating these things, rep repealing the most onerous parts. But the states are doing an awful lot. You look at what the state of Idaho is doing with the governor and lieutenant governor. They are trying to put a less expensive option on the table for people that they can buy. It might not fit the Obamacare standards, but it's, ins but it's good insurance. I do want you to be able to reply. But I, I, so you're, you are advocating for a single payer system though, right? Medicare yes, for all. Okay. Yes. And then. Yeah. I, first of all, I would note that he has voted 50 times to repeal Obamacare. Well, I think it's more than that. Okay. And he ad admits it's more than that. Um, and you would not do that? You, you, you would keep Obamacare in place? You know, I'm not going to stand here and defend Obamacare because it's certainly not perfect. I agree with that. But I would not vote to repeal it either. You know, he talked about taking care of pre-existing conditions. My understanding of the bill that they've got is that insurers would have to insure somebody with a pre-existing condition, but they wouldn't have to cover the condition that is the pre-existing condition. So if you have cancer, you're going to get insurance but that health insurance might not cover cancer. That's not really taking care of the problem. That's simply not true. Okay, that, that, well, that was my understand, understanding but that's of it. Not simply not. The one area that people are beating, up, beating us up on is we do cover pre-existing conditions and you, can't cut, and you can't charge somebody more because of a pre-existing condition unless you discontinue your insurance. If you drop your insurance and then try to get back on a little while later, they can charge you an increased rate for a year the insurance companies can, and then it goes back down to the normal rate that they would charge. That's to encourage people to maintain their health care coverage and not to drop out and then drop back in when they get sick or something like that. So, you know, there are parts of Obamacare that I think most of, agree, most of us agree with. <coughs> Pre-existing conditions, being able to stay on your parents' insurance until you're 26 years old, no discrimination against women. Uh, those are good parts. But they're not the fundamental part of Obamacare. Mr. Swisher. I find it interesting that one of the things the Republicans hated about Obamacare was that it forced people to have health insurance. They were penalized if they didn't have health insurance. That's exactly what this does. If you drop your insurance, you get penalized when you pick insurance back up. Right? It's the same. We're not, we're not changing the problem at all. We're just relabeling it with a bunch of, you know, political speak. But the problem is still there, and we need to fix that. And I think that the single payer, Medicare for all type system is the way to do that. But let me just follow up and ask you about that because we have a single payer system for our veterans, for example, and look at what's happened there. Are there other times when the federal government has been the one and only way to go? Do you think that's been a, a positive way to see uh, the government in action? 
we have allowed pharmaceutical companies, healthcare companies, insurance companies to merge and acquire one another to where they have all the power in the marketplace. You've got to do something to get power back to the consumers. And I think the single payer system is the way to do that. You think it'll get power back to the consumers? Yeah, because that single payer will have negotiating power, you know, with those pharmaceuticals, with those healthcare companies in the marketplace. You know, if that's if that's the main payer and most people are on that, you know, the the pharmaceuticals are going to have to accept what that insurer, that single payer is going to pay. Same thing same thing with healthcare with providers. no downsides because you have a, a federal government bureaucracy running our health care. What they're running is the insurance system, right? I mean, you can still go see your doctor. Is That's my understanding. You can go get, you know, your pharma, pharmaceuticals at Rite Aid or CVS or wherever you want, um, but the single payer is negotiating on the back end for what you're paying and giving you some power in the marketplace. This is what happens with the single payer system as they've got in England and other places. It's not really a single payer system. They have insurance for everybody, which is meager. And then if you're wealthy enough, you go out and buy a health insurance policy. So you have a two tier system. I'm not sure I want the government running our health care system if they can't do any better than they've done with the VA and other things. Uh, what we need to do is get competition back into the marketplace. One area I agree with Aaron on. We need to reform our antitrust laws. We cannot have the too big to fail and all of that kind of stuff that's been going on over the years and that's been a failure on our part. Frank Dodd was supposed to do it, didn't do it. Banks got bigger, insurance companies got bigger and all that kind of stuff. But if you're going to create competition, you've got to reform the antitrust laws in this country. Thanks for the give and take here. Let's move along to another issue and Betsy Russell. Okay, the next topic is guns, which are a big issue in Idaho. Um, we have the third highest rate of gun ownership in the nation. What do you think of our current regulations and current laws on guns, and what, if anything, do you need think that we need to change? And let's start with Mr. Swisher. Yeah, really what this comes down to is personal responsibility, and what you have in Idaho are gun owners who, for the most part, are personally responsible. <laughs> Anytime you have a right, um, there's a personal responsibility that comes with that right, and when it comes to gun legislation, that is the key, is making sure that people who are personally responsible are enjoying their Second Amendment right while we're keeping guns out of the hands of folks who we know or have a suspicion won't be responsible, people who have been convicted of domestic violence, people who suffer from mental uh, health issues. Uh, you know, that's the one thing that I found in the district that kind of surprised me is how upset people were uh, about the lack of mental health services in this state and nationwide. It's something that we're, once again, just not investing in. Um, the Affordable Care Act provided some of those things, but, you know, people are trying to eliminate the Affordable Care Act. We actually need more investment in things like mental health services. You know, two-thirds of suicides um, are committed with a gun, um, and that's, that's a mental health issue. Congressman Simpson, the same question. What, if anything, should we change about our current gun laws and regulations? Are you talking about federal laws or state laws? Either. Either? State legislature is going to deal with, uh, with uh, the state laws and how we deal with guns in this state, and I think they've, been, and I think they've done so responsibly. Uh, I think with the school shootings that have gone on and so forth, you're going to have to harden our schools to some degree, and you're going to have to be more careful. 99.99% .99 of gun owners are responsible people but there's always a crazy person out there, and that's the problem. Now, at a federal level, I actually think that if there is something that makes a legal gun illegal, that that item ought to be banned. That would be bump stocks and other things like that, because they make a normal weapon that's legal an automatic weapon. I think we ought to, I think we ought to, to uh, uh, do that. The other thing is, they keep talking about the background uh, the uh, gun show loophole. And what that is is most guns sold, sold at gun shows are actually by licensed dealers and they have to do background checks. But if you walked in and you wanted to open a booth and sell 20 guns or something like that that you had you're trying to get rid of or something, just as an individual, you don't have to do a background check. I think that's a mistake. I think they ought to do background checks on all of them. That's not going to make a lot of my gun owners very happy. But the reality is, is if you believe that people with mental conditions shouldn't have a gun, or people that are criminals shouldn't have a gun, how are you going to know? How do you know that someone comes in and they walk over to someone and they buy a gun that they're not crazy? 
That's what background checks are supposed to do. And we need to make sure they're quick, they're efficient, so that people can, so that these, these sales in, uh, in uh, gun shows can go on. Mr. Swisher, what is your position on the gun show loophole and on possibly banning bump stocks? I'm definitely for banning bump stocks. It seems like everybody in Washington is. It just, uh, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to happen. Uh, what I would like to see on the national level is a permit to purchase system for certain guns, like handguns, AR-15s. What you would do is, if you wanted to buy one of those weapons, you would go down to your local law enforcement and apply for a permit. The local law enforcement has most of, if not all, the background information uh, that would need to be checked and verified in order to give you that permit. It also allows local law enforcement to just do a basic common sense test as well. Once you have that permit, you can go anywhere you want and buy that, that gun because you have the permit. It, this does a number of things. First of all, it takes the background check out of the hands of Walmart or some private seller or somebody at a gun show. Uh, you know, sometimes those things aren't happening and the enforcement is very lax. If we take the, that background check out of their hands, that fixes the problem. It also fixes the re information reporting problem and as well, and the private seller loophole. A lot of states, not a lot of states, there have been some states that have gone to this model. It's worked very well. Uh, you know, Missouri had it and got rid of it, and they actually saw quite an increase in homicides and gun violence, particularly against police. Congressman, what's your reaction to that? Well, actually, I don't want the federal government to tell me whether I have the right to buy a handgun or not. The background check is not done by Walmart or other people. It's actually done by the federal government. And we need to make sure that the system works so that they can get those responses back quickly. But I can't believe that we would have to go in and say, is it OK if I can buy a handgun? You know, that just doesn't make sense to me. If the background check is done by the federal government, then I guess the federal government does have a say in whether or not you get a gun. The background, the background information is out there, and it needs to be checked by places like Walmart or people that are selling at gun shows, dealers, and things of that sort. They are checking the back. They are doing the background checks. They're responsible for that presently. Let's move along to Doug uh, with another question. And time's getting away from us, so let's see if we can get through a couple more areas quickly. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Dee. Um, Congressman, um, our Morgan Boydston did a report recently about a pair of Texas billionaires, the Wilkes brothers, who were buying up private land across southwest Idaho and blocking access to public lands in some areas. She reported that they've put up gates and no trespassing signs on a Forest Service road. First of all, just what are your thoughts on that particular situation? Uh, it bothers me greatly. Uh, one of the problems with, or one of the, one of the issues with having so much public land, 64% of our state, and we live here because we love our public lands, is having access to those. And a lot of times when you're a billionaire and you can go buy, I can't remember how many hundreds of thousands of acres it was, and you're used to going across the road, and this has happened, happened several times, it's a forest service road, to access your favorite hunting place or hiking place or whatever, <coughs> and they close that access, it's not just going around the 300,000 acres. Sometimes it might be going to another state and coming back because these are rugged mountains in Idaho. And so I, uh, you know, people with private property have the right to, to do what they want, but the reality is this is one of the main reasons I don't want to be given federal land back to the state. I asked for a report on how much it would cost the state of Idaho to maintain those public lands fight the wildfires and other things, and it was substantial. And eventually, the state's going to start selling off some of those public lands. People of Idaho don't want that. Our public lands are not for sale. Mr. Swish. I would agree with uh, everything that the congressman said. I would add one thing. What really puts these public lands under pressure is fiscal irresponsibility, the government needing some form of revenue and seeing those assets there and wanting to sell them and then our extreme income and wealth disparity that, that we've got in the country that allows one or two people to buy up massive swaths of land um, you know, when they get sold. I would fix both those problems. Okay, now to Mark and another question in another area that, that people would be interested in. Well, of course, you know, one of the year's biggest stories uh, is, was the confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. As you both know, the nation was deeply divided on that. Congressman, you put out a statement on Twitter applauding that confirmation. If we can put that up here, I'd like to show our audience. And you said, 
I applaud the confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court throughout his career. Judge Kavanaugh has demonstrated a stalwart commitment to the U.S. Constitution. I'm confident he will approach his work on the nation's highest bench with the same commitment. Many uh, asked for an explanation for your support in light of the testimony that was given by Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and reports of others that accused him of sexual assault decades ago in this time of heightened sensitivity. Um, how did you answer uh, constituents who came to you and said, how do you justify that? First of all, I looked at his record as a, on a, as a judge on the second most uh, important court uh, in the country, the DC Appellate Court. I think he's done a great job. There was so much he said, she said through this thing. I was disgusted, frankly, by the way, and I hate to make this sound partisan, but I was disgusted by the way de the Democrats handle this in the Senate. They knew and had this report and had this letter. During the hearing, Diane Feinstein had it when she met with him, never brought it up, never even said that there were these accusations out there or anything else, and waited until the confirmation hearing was essentially done and then brought it up. I think Dr. Ford was treated horribly by the Democrats. And then you got all the other stuff coming out, and I don't know, the gal that right now they're looking at whether they lied to, to her and her attorney, lied to Congress and that kind of stuff. Uh, have we got to the point in this country where an accusation makes you guilty? If we have, we've gone a long ways away from what we stand for. Mr. Swisher, the process and the confirmation. Yeah, I would not have confirmed him. I didn't think that he had the temperament to be a judge. I think he proved that uh, regardless of what happened with uh, Dr. Ford. You know, as for the process, it was a circus. It's been a circus, and, and this time it was the Democrats' fault, to be honest about it. But the last time the Democrats put someone forward, the Republicans left a seat open on the Supreme Court for almost a year because they wouldn't even give the man a hearing. President Obama took a list of potential nominees to the Republicans. The Republicans picked Merrick Garland. When Obama nominated him, they wouldn't even give him a hearing. It shouldn't be like that. You know, there shouldn't be Democrats who say, I'm not going to vote for this person before they've even heard who the nominee is. And you shouldn't have the leader of the Senate, Ms. Mitch McConnell, saying that he's not going to allow a hearing before he even knows who the Democratic nominee is. The whole thing has been turned into a circus by career politicians in Washington, and it needs to stop. And the other thing I'd point out is that about half the Democratic caucus, I don't think it was quite half, a number in the Democratic Democratic senators said before we even knew who he was going to nominate that they would never vote for an appointment by this president. Well, they've kind of taken themselves out of the debate. It is getting crazy. What Mitch McConnell did with Merrick Garland, uh, he was following the Biden rule. It says in the year of an election, you don't appoint someone to the Supreme Court. What happens when uh, it looks like your uh, a president is going to get elected of the opposite party, and you're getting up there on age in your Supreme Court. So do three or four of you resign so that the current president in his last year can appoint these appointments to the Supreme Court? That was the Biden rule. It says you don't do that. During that election year, presidential election year, you don't appoint a Supreme Court uh, individual. And I, you know, that's the Senate. The Senate is a strange place to me. Mr. Swisher, uh, <laughs> during your campaign tour, uh, what did you hear uh, from concerns of citizens about what appears to be a right-leaning Supreme Court now, if there were concerns? I, there are concerns. You, you get the typical concerns about over the abortion debate. Um, the other thing that I heard was that this court is going to be so pro-business that consumers and, and workers are not going to be represented fairly, or, or people don't fee, feel they'll be represented here fairly if they have a hearing before the Supreme Court over, over business issues. It's, it's a huge problem. We need, to stop, we need to stop the circus that has become the nominating process, um, but we also have to stop nominating people that we know how they're going to vote or have a certain political bent. The, the Supreme Court was not supposed to be a political organization. It's supposed to be a judicial organization. 
if I might. Or can we move on? Are sure. We, okay. I'd like I'd like to, uh, Mr. Swisher, give you a little bit of time here because, as I mentioned at the top, we want to uh, be very cautious and careful to make sure that it's equal time this evening, and you're a little behind. So I thought I would ask you <laughs> to talk a little bit about your book first, real quickly. Um, Congressman Simpson, have you read Mr. Swisher's book? Yes, I have. Okay, interesting. Might have a follow-up question there then, <laughs> Mr. Swisher. Your book. You you have ideas. You you say this book, um, which uh, is resuscitating America provides a comprehensive and specific plan to solve America's financial and economic problems. Um, how is the book selling? How many books have you sold? Um, and, you know, to get ideas, One. traction in Washington, D.C. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> traction in Washington, D.C. You know, how do you think you would get your ideas from this book and and whatever? Uh, I think you have another book coming out, if I heard right. I do. I tried to get it done before the election and, and, and couldn't do it. But. Okay. Well, in, in, either, in either case, how, I mean, Congress has 435 members. You'd be one and you'd be the new guy on the block. How yeah. do you take those good ideas and, and get some traction? But first of all, just about your book. How's it selling? And, and do you think you're, you're resonating with people with your ideas? You know, I've never been a very good self-promoter. Uh, and so the book had some sales the first year it was out. Uh, those kind of died away. And in the last year since I've been out uh, on the campaign trail, sales have picked up. Um, it's not a bestseller by any stretch of the imagination. But people from both sides of the political spe spectrum who have read it um, seem to enjoy it, appreciate the thoughts. And that, I think, is really the key for someone going to Washington. We've got a lot of lawyers in Washington. We've got some doctors. We don't have many hardly any economists. Um, not only am I an economist and can speak about these things intelligently, I bring a new approach that I, th I hope opens the door to people from both sides of the aisle. Uh, so they say, okay, let's sit down and hear this. Explain to me how it's going to work. And I can do that. I, obviously, I did it in the book. And you think you can do that? in Congress. You know, if I'm elected on November 6th, I'm going to immediately start reaching out to other people from both sides of the aisle, particularly freshman congressional representatives, talking to them and saying, look, this is what I think the priority list needs to be when we hit Washington. These are the things that we need to work on and why we need to work on them in that order. Um, it's it's going to take a lot of elbow grease, so to speak. But, um, you know, I, I wrestled in college. I'm up for it. <laughs> Quickly, did, did you get any good ideas from Mr. Swisher's book? It's not entirely crazy. <laughs> no. There are some good things in there. The reality is, is if all I read is things I agree with, I don't need to read them. Oftentimes I read things that I disagree with. But I always learn something because, you know, I don't know everything. And there are some ideas in there that are worth exploring further. i got to give him that uh, credit for that. But I will tell you how hard it is to reach out to 435 other members of Congress. I decided I was going to meet every member of Congress when I first went there. So we just set up 15-minute appointments to go around and meet people. Hi, I'm Mike Simpson from Idaho and da-da-da-da and that kind of stuff and, and get to know who they are because Congress is entirely about relationships. It took me a year, probably a year and a half before I got around to meet everybody. So it's hard to do, but it takes a lot of work. I think we have time for one last question from our panelists. Doug, you want to take it? All right, I'll try to shorten this question up then. Um, are you in, Mr. Swisher, are you in support of? concerned about or against President Trump's trade war with China in terms of the tariffs? Those options are supportive, concerned about, or against uh, <laughs> trade wars. I am definitely against trade wars. There is a, phys uh, there's a fundamental idea that President Trump wants to protect American workers or at least make trade fair for them, and I agree with that. The problem that I have with him is in the approach. He needs to be more deliberate. He needs to work through the Congress. It shouldn't be, you know, a, a fly by the seat of your pants policy where he starts a trade war and then comes in like the hero and, and produces some sort of modified trade deal that's slightly better than the old, um, while Idaho farmers are, are wondering, you know, whether or not they're going to be able to sell their crops and their goods to foreign countries. Uh, that just doesn't work. Congressman? Well, I've been trying to figure out his trade policy. Uh, I'm against tariffs. I don't think they're a good idea. They're just a tax paid by consumers on products when they buy them. But I'm trying to figure out if this is kind of the art of the deal, where you stake out a position out here knowing you want to get to here, you stake out a position out here, and then come back to this, which is kind of what happened with NAFTA. We got a slightly improved NAFTA, uh, and that's what he did with North Korea. I mean, they called each other names for a while. Now they're buddies. 
Uh, that's what he did with NATO. You guys aren't paying enough of your dues and stuff, and we're going to pull out of NATO. We all knew we weren't going to pull out of NATO, but all of a sudden our NATO allies are starting to pay more into, the, into their military. So I've been trying to decide how this is going on. If it ends up with better trade deals, great. I don't like the tariffs and what it's doing in the short term what it's going to do to the steel industry and everybody that uses steel, substantial price increases. They told me the other day that the price of an automobile is going to go up about $6,000 because, because of the steel. Uh, so if this is the art of the deal, it needs to get done quickly. But with NAFTA, we got a slightly better deal. Ask the dairy farmers in Idaho. They had a 25% tariff going products into Canada. They don't anymore. Let me ask a quick question. I, we have just time for a quick question here. And um, Mr. Swisher, I'm sure you've heard uh, that a vote for a Democrat uh, in Congress is a vote for Nancy Pelosi in the far left of the Democratic Party, no matter your moderate views that you have expressed this evening. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I would be looking for a new generation of leadership. Um, you know, we have this debate every time we come to an election year. And it doesn't get anybody health care. It doesn't raise anybody's wages. It's just kind of one of those sideshow issues. Um, I, I think Nancy Pelosi has had her time, and I would be looking for somebody new. I just have a couple of seconds left. Uh, Congressman Simpson, how about you? Is a vote for... Uh, I wouldn't vote for Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> you wouldn't vote for... I kind of guessed that. <laughs> um, but, but, you, but you've been known to attract moderate voters in Idaho. Um, when it comes to President Trump, you've been voting with him a lot in Congress. What should voters consider when they consider you and your relationship to President Trump's views? I look at the policies that are being enacted, and I agree with many of the policies that the Trump administration has put forward. Uh, and I think you can see the results of those, whether it's our economy or other things. Uh, uh, when you agree with the policies, and I kind of have to ignore some of the other stuff that goes on. All right. Well, we're out of time, except for some closing statements, and we appreciate you both very much for the engagement that you've provided with us this evening. And let's begin with a closing statement from Congressman Simpson. Well, thank you, Dee, and thanks, panelists, and thank uh, Channel 7 for hosting this debate. But I want to talk about something a little more important than this election or any election. We live in a divided country, and we seem to have lost our civility. Whether it's shooting of a congressman and his police, and police protection at a baseball game, whether it's white nationalists in Charlotte's, Charlottesville, whether it's disrupting dinners of people that are just going out with their family to have dinner in a restaurant and disrupting it because they happen to be members of this administration, or whether it's sending pipe bombs to people who are your political opponents. This cannot be the political normal. We cannot accept this. We need to get back to civility. At the end of the American Revolution, the French writer Turgot said, America is the hope of mankind. I still believe that's true. We need to start acting like we deserve that distinction. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Mr. Swisher. Yes. I want to again thank KTVB for putting on tonight's debate and for the viewers who are watching at home. Our nation is in desperate need of a comprehensive economic plan energy independence, immigration reform, solutions to our environmental problems, and a balanced budget. I have the skills and expertise to go to Washington and get those things done. On all these issues, we need more than somebody telling us that they're working on it. When one party controls all three branches of government in Washington, we shouldn't have to question why there's too much gridlock to do simple things like reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act, reauthorizing the Land and Water Conservation Fund, or getting people access to affordable health care. There certainly wasn't gridlock in Washington when corporate America wanted a debt finance tax cut. I think Washington should work for us. I'm Aaron Swisher, and I'm asking for your vote on November 6th. Thank you both for being with us, and thank you. We'll be back tomorrow night with another debate.